Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. We know across Virginia there's been growing concerns and controversies over books and materials in public and school libraries. There are calls for stricter policies regarding access by minors and suggesting some titles have no place in public libraries. We're joining me in a conversation on the controversies surrounding library access policies and book removal is Julie Phillips, who's Director of Libraries for Botetourt County, and Mike Lockerbie, who's a Botetourt County attorney and member of the Spielman, Thomas, and Battle in Roanoke. And thank you both so much for joining me. Thank you. Good to be here. So before we get to, and it's more complicated than some people uh, think in terms of the issues relative to what you confronted it, but my goodness, y'all were right in the middle of quite a, a battle, intense, and uh, policy uh, statements. What surprised you about having gone through that process? I'll start with you, Mike. What surprised me was I was surprised at the intensity in particular. Uh, I know that in some ways that probably sounds a little bit trite, but the intensity of the feelings that people had really on both sides of the issue, both people who f felt very, very strongly that the books should not be in the library and the people who felt very strongly that they should. Um, I was also uh, pleasantly surprised at the, just the number of people in the middle who had very mixed feelings about things or had some sort of third way of looking at things that they thought was important. And Julie, what about you? What surprised you about going through that? I'm not sure I was surprised by anything. I've been watching this happen throughout the nation for a while, but I think something that surprised a lot of people who were new to this is the fact that most of the concerns about library materials were coming from people who did not use libraries or did not have minor children. So that, I think, just added an interesting dimension to the conversation. And so would you say that this is, and I think you, you hit it there, that this is kind of a new phenomenon? I mean, it, it wasn't routinely getting complaints about books per se or, or part of the collection. Is that true to say? Right, yeah. Uh, many of the books in question had been in the collection for some time. Some of them 13 years. I can think of a title that was in the collection probably 25 years ago in different editions. Um, so this is new for Botetourt, for sure. And do you think that there's a political, um, I'm not so much Democrat, Republican, maybe liberal, conservative, I mean, in this polarized atmosphere we're in, do you think that that is a telltale sign or, or it reflects the, the culture out there? Like I think it's uh, definitely uh, in, indicative of where the culture is and perhaps is going. Uh, I certainly saw some political correlation. I don't know that it was fully a correlation, but I, there was certainly a lot of people who across all boundaries said, you know what, this is, this is really a parent issue. This is not a board of supervisors issue. This is a parent issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your thoughts on that? And I would say the same. Most people fall somewhere in the middle. Um, where they're just trying to understand what's going on. I have noticed that, you know, certainly um, concerns about library materials are not necessarily a left or right issue. Mm -hmm. A lot of times both sides of the spectrum will use the exact same language um, to describe, you know, what ideas they think should be in public discourse. So they will talk about protecting children on both sides of the spectrum. Um, they will talk about how to create a safe space. Um, for people. So it's the same language and very similar concerns, but different ideas about how to get there. And do you think that um, patrons and parents, I guess you would welcome if there are concerns to at least bring them through and, 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 and make you aware of them. So it's not that you would not want to learn if there are concerns. Is that a fair statement to, to make? Absolutely. We are always open to feedback and we listen very carefully to what our patrons tell us and they're not shy. So our patrons <laughs> traditionally will tell us exactly what they think of what they're reading in our collection, what they're accessing. Now to date we have not had a single complaint that a minor has accessed material in our library collection that any of the parents or caregivers using that collection uh, find objectionable or harmful. So, so far we haven't had a single complaint like that where a minor has actually accessed resources like that. Um, and that's, that, that's an important point, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Do you, you feel the same way, that, that certainly patrons can express concerns oh, and bring it? 
Absolutely, Pretty. and I believe our policy provides for parents also to make suggestions as to titles they think might be a value to the collection. So on both, both ways of looking at that, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the issues, and one was just that about access itself. Um, stimulating, should, is there an age where it's appropriate for one that would need an adult or someone designated? And so access seemed to be one of the general issues. So our policy is that if a child is under 13, they need to have an adult age 18 or older with them while they're using the library facilities. And that's a broad ranging policy, you know, this is a public setting. Um, so it's not just about the materials, it's about the safety of the child and um, making sure that they're not disrupting anything or anybody. Um, and then the parent has full control over that child's account, full transparency and access to that child's library card, all of its activities, the checkouts, any holds they put on until that child turns 18. And any thing you no, like I've to I've got anything? nothing to follow up. That's, that's what our policy is. And yeah. Yeah. As it relates to access. Well, and then the larger concerns, I guess, were those related to age appropriateness in terms of access to material. Um, I gotta say, now, I'm, I'm one of those. <laughs> I think there are materials that are, quote, age appropriate um, and not. And we certainly have movies that are rated so that you can kind of, they may not listen to you, you can say, no, I don't want you to see that, or I don't want you to see that. Uh, matter of fact, July 1 here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, I guess it is, minimum age for supposedly online viewing pornography is 18, the same way if you go to an adult bookstore. Um, and so age appropriateness seems to be a legitimate concern, but how do you implement that? Is that the issue? So I would agree. There, is, there are things that are age appropriate and not. Now we do not have any pornography in our collection at all, mm -hmm. even for adults. Um, and our children's collection obviously is wide ranging. And ev what I found is every parent and every child has a different need. They have different ideas about what's appropriate and when for each child. And our responsibility is to meet all of those needs across a vast spectrum of people um, to make sure that they have what they need and rely on the parent to decide what is appropriate for your child and when are they ready. And, um, and so the notion that, okay, if there are, quote, ratings or materials that might be um, more sensitive as it relates to underage, why could they not be in a separate kind of uh, section, or at least you would be aware of that ahead of time, that becomes problematic? It does, and actually Mike might be a good one to ask about the legal aspects. Of well, I, I can speak to the legal aspects. There, are, There's a lot of case law out there. Um, for one thing, it's important to distinguish a school library from a public library. School library is the, because the law is different, hmm due to the different purposes. School library is dedicated toward a pedago pedagogical mission. And consequently, when you have, you can take books out of that library or do your collection development directed in a certain direction to only have books there that are directed toward that mission that you're trying to carry out. A free public library is designed to be of broader interest to the public. And therefore, you, the way that the law looks at it, and I think also the way that our policymakers and the policy experts like Ms. Phillips have looked at it, is that you want to have a broad spectrum that is going to be um, of appeal and of use to a broad section of the public. And that broad section might be much smaller than a majority provided that it's a section of the public that finds those books to be particularly useful. One of the problems is when you're trying to pull books out is the classification systems that you have involved in here. And Julie can talk more to the classification systems. Um, there's a couple of them. There's Dewey, there's Library of Congress, there's a couple of different systems out there. But who undertakes doing those ratings? You could if you wanted to, let's say, pull out all books that have to do with parenting or sexuality or do something along those lines. You're always gonna be either over-inclusive or under-inclusive. There are always gonna be books that don't get classified under the, that 
rubric because that's not how the system is designed to be set up. Um, and and when, you have, when we have had cases in the past, I say we, federal courts have had cases in the past where parents got to say, uh, for, what, for one instance was a, a court struck down a rule that said that if four parents said that they thought a book should be moved from the children's section to the adult section, it had to be moved. The court said that that's arbitrary and a violation of the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. So trying to draw that rating system within the context of a public library is extremely difficult from the practical perspective and it's extremely administratively time consuming. Well, I will tell you, um, I just recently was made aware of the website, um, uh, We Are Brace. I guess you're aware of that. That stands for We Are Botetourt Residents Against Child Exploitation. And you go to the website, and of course they have their rationale and their argument, but they also identify the books where they have illustrations and the content and stuff like that. Um, I know I'm a generational difference, but I was personally shocked. I'm, I'm not going to lie about it. Um, it struck me. Um, and what was interesting is where some of them said age two to five appropriate, five to eight appropriate, eight to twelve. I, some of the, I just, for the life of me, given my belief, attitudes, and values, I just, it really shocked me in a way. Um, and so it seems to be that parents, there are two aspects of that. One is, now I know what's in the library. I mean, my goodness. Uh, then I'm going to have to make as an apparent. I had no idea of such stuff. I mean, literally, that's how naive I guess I was or am. Um, and so the parent is going to have to exercise, I guess, more control because the library isn't really legally or otherwise having to filter or to accommodate what I would call community standards, maybe. So making that difference between, I thought it'd be the other way around. I thought a public library would be a little bit more cautious than like a university or a school. So I was surprised by that. Any reaction? I mean, we do serve everyone in the community. And as Mike said, that includes minority of viewpoints mm -hmm. and all the rest. So one thing I will point out is that our collection is more conservative than almost any library in our region. And LGBTQ materials, which is the primary point, it's not really sexually explicit materials, but more LGBTQ subjects. In our children's collection, that represents 0.04% of our collection. So it's a very small portion. We're talking, you know, maybe 20 something titles that I think have been identified so far. Um, and that is also people taking maybe a picture or a paragraph out of its holistic context. So one thing that the courts have often ruled, and Mike would know more about this, is that you cannot say something is pornographic by taking a page or a paragraph or an image from it. Um, one book that has appeared in these lists was actually ruled by a Virginia judge as there were no grounds to say it was pornographic. Um, and so the concern may not be as much pornographic, but now some of those illustrations, the age appropriateness, I, I'm sorry. I mean, it, there was one, I mean. I, I, and I, I think it's fair I too disagree. to just, point out that <laughs> many of these titles were purchased at the request of parents who felt that they were helpful mm -hmm. to their children. So there are different ideas out there. And fortunately, all the use of library materials is voluntary. So mm -hmm. yeah. people can decide to bypass them. Well, so. What is the process? How do you decide what books to, what guides your selection in, in purchasing books? What do you look at and how do you go about that decision making? Well, we have a collection development policy that lays out specific criteria for how we select books. So we have a team of selectors who listen to our patrons, look at the community, find out what the needs are, um, recommend things, and then those go to our materials manager and then me. So there are multiple checkpoints along the way to say, should a book be on our shelves? Um, we'll look at things like, is this topic something of interest to the community? Um, how is it reviewed? So we'll look at professional reviews from people who have read the titles. Mm -hmm. Now we add over 700 titles per month. We cannot read them all. Wow. Um, so <laughs> that is why we rely very heavily on professional reviews <laughs> and the people who have read them to say, 
would this be good for our collection? And we have multiple criteria that we'll go through. A book doesn't have to meet all of them to get in the collection. But ultimately, we only add titles that we fully expect our community will want. We're not interested in just stocking the shelves for no one to use them. And anything related to that? No, I would, I, I, with regard to the collection development, yeah, it's a well-developed uh, system. It's overseen primarily by the library board. Of course, the Board of Supervisors has 10,000 things on its plate. The, they appoint many different committees. With specified, with specified or special interest in a particular area to oversee that area. And the library board is a group of people with particular interest and, and lifetime expertise in that area. Um, and they oversee making sure that, that those policies are in line and then the staff implements those. And if there is a <coughs> concern um, about a particular um, uh, volume, what have you, I'm assuming there's a process that someone can code. Would you just kind of explain a little bit about the process? Sure. So just like our collection development policy, our reconsideration process has been in place for over 30 years. Mm. It's the same one. Uh, so what someone can do is just come to us with their concerns. Um, usually we try to talk to them first just to understand what their concerns are and explain the role of a public library because many people just really don't know. Mm. Um, but then if they still feel like this material needs to be moved or removed from the collection, we have what is called a reconsideration form that they can fill out. That then goes to a committee of people who look at the item. They usually read the entire book. Um, they will look at reviews, they'll look at our collection development policy, and they'll see, is this in alignment or not? Um, if it's not aligned with our policies, then they can recommend that it be removed. If it's in alignment, then they'll make a recommendation that it remain the same. Um, then that comes to me, and I'll get back to the patron with a response. And they can appeal that to the library board if they still feel dissatisfied. So it's not just a capricious decisions at all. I mean, in other words, it's a process that one can follow and has been in place, you said, for, th for 30 years. Over 30 years. It's probably closer to 40 at this stage. Yeah, it came well, from the mid-80s, I believe, is actually when it was originally put into place. And it's been reviewed probably every decade or so through my office and through my predecessor's county attorney offices to, to make sure it was in accordance with best practices under developing federal law, and it always has been. Well, I have to confess that I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not a parent today. I, it, it is an incredibly tough job in the environment that we're in, I think, um, with all the political, uh, social, and, 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 and divide and polarization. What's interesting, though, as a parent, my aha moment in preparing for our discussion was that now as a parent, I had no knowledge that such materials could be accessed. But if you're under 13, I would be able to be there. And of course, I would be one of those parents. I guess you wouldn't see my children in the public library very much unless I was there. Um, but without any kind of warning for me to know, but now because it's awareness and you don't really, the library doesn't help. And okay, here's a caution. You need to be aware this has been certified by this. You almost force us to be into an all or none situation as a parent as it relates to the library. And I see that this is kind of a larger trend that's going as it relates to people saying, well, okay, home schools rather than public schools, charter schools rather than public, let the money follow because we're getting so the choice of protection seems to be decreasing in some ways. And so I see this all tied together in terms of, wow, what a parent needs to know because awareness is half of it. And then I can be responsible for what my child can check out or not. How would you respond to my observation or concern there? I mean, one thing I would point out is that this is not as new as it sounds. We've certainly been here from, you know, every 20 years or so. So you think about the 1930s, the 1950s, mm -hmm. late 70s, early 80s, late 90s, early aughts. We went through the exact same process where parents said, we did not know this was on the shelves. We want these removed. And it would go through that same cycle again. Um, so even though the topics themselves take slightly different feels every time, because Anytime there's cultural change, anytime there's societal change, there's a lot of tension 
And there are really key issues that everyone's trying to work out together. Um, and when you have very strong feelings on opposite sides of the spectrum and different ideas about the exact same books. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are parents who think these books are ideal. There are parents who think they're harmful. Um, when you have such opposing positions, it's really up to the parents themselves to figure out what are my family's values? What do I want to teach my children? And it can't stop at the library. Um, you're not going to find anything in our library that is any more shocking than what that child has on their smartphone, what they're seeing in their social media apps, and what their peers are sharing with them. So that, you know, it's very hard to be a parent. I would agree with you. Um, there are so many, children are exposed to so many things that parents usually have no idea about. Um, so it's, it's a lot of work to stay engaged, but I think that is also part of the relationship with a, between a parent and a child. Um, helping pass on those family values and helping that child work through difficult questions and learn how to think critically. Mm -hmm. and, and I am the parent of a couple of little kids. <laughs> God bless and, you. <laughs> and I, I do accompany them to the library. I am generally conscious of what they read and frankly it's not that difficult to do. Mm -hmm. It's just not that hard and by the time that they're doing it on their own you know, when they hit the, you know, 11 to 15 time period when they're making their own choices, they probably should be. I will have brought them up by that point. I, the older one's getting up to the edge of that time such that they are able to make those choices about what they should be reading with a certain amount of dad looking over the shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're down within uh, three or four minutes or so, but I want to provide an opportunity. Uh, for each of you to make kind of your final thoughts. Uh, you've gone through a public experience. Um, some of the meetings were quite intense. This is about public policy and community standards and various things. Um, so what would you say to people as now having gone through this experience and going forward? And I'll start with you, Julie. Sure, I would say leave the door open for conversation. I love to talk to people. Um, I love it when people can come with their concerns and we can talk them out and try to understand how the library collection benefits them and how our current practices protect their rights just as much as the other people in the community who they may not see on a regular basis. So in public libraries, we see a cross section of the community every day. Many of these community members never come in contact with each other. So I often hear statements like the community doesn't want X, Y, Z. Mm. But I know that's not true because I see other people in the community who do. Um, so it's very important that people look outside themselves and our public library is an opportunity to do that. How do other people feel and think and experience the world differently? Um, that's a way for them to be exposed to different ideas if they choose, mm -hmm. that's certainly their choice. It's all voluntary. Um, to meet some neighbors who may think differently than they do, and to find common ground. Right. And I would, I would largely agree with that. There are a lot of really good debates to be had about what the future of collection development should look like for public libraries. One of the problems that we have had is that many people want to have a quick win or a quick I want my thing done with these books rather than having a larger policy debate. Um, as a lawyer, it's not my role in the world to tell people what policies to make. It's to tell them where the bumpers lie, where the shores are that they could run into and hit the rocks and sink. <laughs> uh, and, and so I see a wide, wide, broad stream that people can tack left or right within to come to what will be appropriate and right for their community. But when you try to look for the quick win, you wind up oftentimes in federal court and things don't go very well there for you if you're trying to remove books out of the library because you don't like the viewpoint that they're coming from. Uh, I'm very lucky to have worked in my career for two boards of supervisors in Louisa County first and then in Botetourt County that were made up of people of judgment and in integrity whom I could serve, therefore, with the utmost of integrity. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work for people who, um, 
who can follow what the public writ large wants out of the public policy of the county. And I would agree with, with Ms. Phillips. The many people talk about what they think the community wants, and I think that they would be shocked to find out what a jury of their peers actually thinks if they looked at a book. Well, I have to say this has been very informative and eye-opening to me. And I also want to thank you for your public service in this particular regard, and, um, and especially encountering what was uh, intense uh, discussions and meetings and what have you, but I very much appreciate the role that you play in that as a public servant, for sure. Well, that's all the time we have. I want to thank my guests, Julie Phillips and Mike Lockerbie, and I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.